on Channel News Asia. Welcome back and joining us today to dig a little deeper into some of the news stories that got our attention is Matt Driscoll, a senior editor at Reuters News. Great to have you as usual, Matt. Good morning. So let's take a look at our big story today. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Mideast allies pledge to help U.S. fight Islamic State. And that's about U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's meeting with Arab State allies. Uh, during it, they agreed to join the U.S.-led military campaign against IS and help stop the flow of foreign fighters and financing to the extremist group. And this in The Guardian, Assad, Moscow and Tehran condemn Obama's plan for airstrikes against ISIS. The Syrian government and allies Moscow and Tehran warn Obama an offensive without Syrian consent would violate international law and undermine national sovereignty. And finally, this one from the Washington Post, what the world thinks of Obama's plan to fight the Islamic State. And that basically just breaks down various nations' reactions to the U.S. president's speech, including some muted responses from China in particular. Now, of course, you know, this is a serious day. It's still uh, September 11th in the United States, and they're marking the 13th anniversary of the 9-11 terror attack. So a lot of sensitivity around terrorism in general at this time. This speech, though, it wasn't meant to coincide with that date, but he essentially declared war without saying the word war. That's the American, that's that? the American way. <laughs> I mean, what do you make of all of, all of this? Uh, you know, there are times, just as a human being, I, I wish the Middle East would just go away. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a huge problem and has been a problem for how, for how many hundreds of years, but, but you know, recently, uh, with the war in Iraq, uh, the several wars in Iraq, uh, the problems in Kuwait, the problems in Syria. Uh, I mean, Syria now, the last figure I saw was 191,000 people dead. And the only time everybody really got excited about it was when they used chemical weapons. And they said, oh, no, you know, that's terrible. But, you know, this has been going on for so long. Uh, I didn't actually watch Obama's speech, but again, and, and I think we discussed this the last time I was on the air, the problem with this is the clash of civilizations. Uh, and bombs and bullets are not going to fix the problems that are at the heart of this. Uh, and, and I frankly, I don't know how to fix the problem, uh, but you've got a lot of disenfranchised people. And, and it's not necessarily people that are angry at the United States, they're angry at their own leaders. Uh, and you see this with the civil war in Syria. You see this with what happened in Egypt, uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, people are, you know, basically you have total totalitarian regimes in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia, which is deathly afraid of, of their own people, and which is why they they crack down on any dissent. Uh, you've got these regimes in place, and that's what the the local people, that's what they're trying to fight. Certainly very complicated considering, you know, a lot of the Arab states have been accused of financing and supporting these terrorists. Um, what do you make of the uh, ties that uh, Senator Kerry is making out there? Do you think it's going to be effective? Because there's no ground troop support that they're sending, even though it's in their backyard. It's more of kind of we're going to support the U.S.-led coalition, but no kind of concrete commitment. Well, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Congress, even though I worked for the U.S. Congress for a year, a long time ago in my younger days. But John Boehner came out, the Speaker of the House, came out and said, you know, an F-16 is not a strategy. And that's part of the problem here is what is the strategy? There's, it, it's back when, I forget who came up with the saying, there's, a, there's an old children's game called whack-a-mole where, you know, problem comes up, the mole comes up and you knock it down. And, and somebody said, you know, George Bush's strategy was whack-a-mole where you, you know, problem comes up here and you try to push it down. And I think it's a little bit like that is, okay, well, Islamic State is now a problem and we're going to bomb them. Uh, but again, there's no strategy to get to the root problem. Uh, it's one thing to kill the fighters, but when you do that in many cases, you just create more fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the ideology, isn't it? It's about the ideology, and again, it, and I, I hate to keep harping on this, but it goes back to the clash of civilizations that Samuel Huntington wrote about in the 1990s, and we're seeing that writ large in the Middle East. Because the people, you know, whether, you know, I don't know where in the Koran it says, you know, cut the head off of a journalist uh, who's there trying to expose the problems in the, in the air. I don't think it does say that. 
but you've got these people that feel disenfranchised for whatever reason, whether it's their own leaders, whether they think it's America supporting their leaders, or whatever, but you need to get to the root of that problem and solve that problem or you're going to be fighting people for the rest of your lives. Mm -hmm. Well, they have said, John Boehner himself said that he doesn't, you know, whose boots are going to be on the ground was the question, because he thinks that if you are going to have this fight or take it to them, then someone's going to have to go down and get their hands dirty. Well, I think at some point the United States is going to get very tired if it isn't already very say, tired, tired of, yeah. of fighting wars. And how long do you fight? How long can you fight? How long can you sustain it? Well, the other aspect of it, too, is the president has been, you know, his legacy, a lot of these articles are talking about how he was kind of focused on, um, you know, bringing pulling Jews out yeah, bringing of Jews wars others. like this. And now he's ending on this type of note, because well, this is going to last for at least two years and beyond. And again, I mean, I, I you know, I don't agree with, with everything that the Speaker of the House says, but I think he made a very good point is what is the strategy? Okay. And whether it's Obama, whether it's the U.S. government as a whole, they've got to come up with a strategy not only to, uh, to disable the terrorist threat and, and put a stop to that, but to get at the heart of the real problems that affect those people on the ground there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to our next story now. Another we turn big to story. The, yes, today online for Pistorius, uh, negligent when he shot girlfriend. That's according to Judge uh, Thokuzile Masipa, who is presiding over the case as she cleared the Paralympic athlete of murder charges with the verdict on culpable homicide still to come. What do you make of, the, of this one? There's a lot of people who were surprised, actually, that, that he was uh, sort of uh, let off of, from the murder charge. Well, I, I can, you know, I think the murder, they have a very strict interpretation of murder where there has to be a premeditation, he has to plan it, and, and sort of those things, which is very similar to, I used to cover the courts in the United States, it's very similar to that, where there has to be planning beforehand and, and those kinds of things to, to find someone guilty of premeditated murder. Um, I, you know, from what I've seen, I, I haven't been following the case every day, but of course I've been keeping up with it. You know, to me it sounds like, as we were discussing before we came on the air, more of a crime of passion. I, mean, I think he probably flew into a rage. But, I mean, the thing that I was interested in, and this is probably the copy editor coming out at me, there's part of the story where it says that the judge uh, said that he didn't, that she, that Pistorius could not foresee he could kill anyone the night he shot his girlfriend. The guy had a gun. Mm. And, and, I, and he mm. was pointing at someone. And he was he, trained. And he was, he he's trained with guns. He's, he, you know, all of that. I grew up with guns. And here's the rule that I was taught. You never point a gun at someone unless you plan to shoot them and kill them. Because it's so dangerous to, to point a gun at someone. You don't do it under any circumstances unless you're going to pull the trigger. Yeah. So if he's got the gun out and he knows somebody's in there, how could he not foresee that he was going to kill him? That's what the gun is for. That's the only thing a gun is for, is to kill someone. Yeah. So I, I didn't really understand that. But again, to me, you know, is it, uh, was it premeditated murder? I personally, even though I haven't been in the courtroom, I personally think the guy flew into a rage and, and got yeah, mad. I, I tend to side with you too, Matt. I mean, in the court of public opinion, though, it seems like everyone is outraged that he didn't get uh, convicted of the intentional murder charge. So well, I don't know I, if that's just stuff we're seeing from social media or the way things, the media is covering it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and you have, you know, we talked about the O.J. Simpson trial. It was very similar. You know, people are kind of reacting to that. And it's sort of South Africa's version of, of the O.J. Simpson trial. And people are going to have all kinds of opinions, even though they haven't been in the courtroom and listened to the evidence. And also worth noting that they might not have a full understanding of how the law interprets Correct. the actions and, and that South place. African law, I mean, I'm, you know, they, this is being tried in front of a judge and not mm -hmm. a jury. There's no jury. So completely different from yeah. the U.S. Or, or But she's known to be other. tough as nails, though. She, I'm very, what I've seen in, in some of the, the background that I've read about the judge, she's, you know, I'm very impressed by her qualifications, and mm -hmm. she seems to... She seems to have done a, a very good job in controlling the case, keeping everybody you in know, line. in line, mm -hmm. very much different from what happened in the United States in the O.J. Simpson trial where yeah. the lawyers were just going nuts and doing basically whatever they wanted. She seems to run a very tight ship, and, and I've been very impressed with that. Mm -hmm. So, so the, court, the court case, well, the, the uh, conclusions will be sort of wrapping up today, so we'll see what charges. Couple of murder couple is still homicide, there. She kind of hinted, yeah. yeah or, which is kind of like a manslaughter charge mm -hmm. in, in different in jurisdictions, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to our last story. A bit lighter, this one coming from The Independent. Uh, for this uh, woman finds herself in Southeast Asia with a little help from Photoshop to satirize Facebook bragging. 
We create an ideal world online which reality can no longer meet. That's a quote from her. It was part of a university project. The 25-year-old used fake photos to appear to her friends to be enjoying a five-week holiday in Southeast Asia. In reality, she was at home in Amsterdam the whole time. <laughs> now, I love uh, how she chose Southeast Asia. Yes, maybe because she thought like maybe her friends didn't know it so well. That's and, right. Maybe. They could. And she I'll, didn't have a uh, way to yeah, but she's cover very thorough, it up. Though. She was like uh, taking photos of herself in her room and she'd decorate her room like a hostel and then, you know, have Skyped her parents that way. I looked, I, her bedroom. I looked at the video that, that she also posted up uh, on Vimeo, I think uh -huh. it, it was, and looked at, at what she did. And I wish I had these Photoshop skills. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I use Photoshop sometimes, but I'm not very good at it. And she, she seems to be a lot better at it than, than I am. But again, you know, I mean, it's, it's, we were talking about this before we came on the air. I think it's, it's if I had 42 days off, I could find something better to do than this, even though this was for some school project or whatever. But you it's know, kind of taking, taking it to, to an extreme. I might do like a week for the project and then, and then go on a holiday. But, but, and see if people could tell the difference, I suppose. Well, and, and I want to make the point that we talked about earlier, too. It's, it's like, well, she did this to show that how we use media distorts reality. And I'm like, well, we've known that for yeah. 100 years. I mean, of course it does. You know, one Fox News versus, you know, uh, CNN versus Channel News Asia or but, whatever. But, but that's on a, like a, on a corporation s s scale. This is on a personal, like Facebook but scale. But you know people, scale. friends that, you, you know, know they, in real life, they, they might, not, yeah, they may they. not be uh, telling the truth, but no, they Nobody gets out of bed, takes a selfie there. and, and puts it up on Facebook with their hair all messed up and everything. <laughs> you know, they get up, they brush their teeth, they, do, <laughs> they put the hairspray Unless on. Unless they hashtag it, no makeup. Oh, wow, yeah. And then it's meant to be cool. Yeah. No, I reckon they still probably do do all that <laughs> and then say. You know. No, but I think in general, though, the soci so so sociological uh, experiment here showing that you could use these things to fabricate an entire reality. Yes. I mean, there are people out there that I believe would be able to do this. Well, and, and this is, you know, again, it's part of the problem because you'll see con artists uh, yeah. that can, you know, that are trying to you know, uh, create a fake company so that you invest and, oh, they're on Facebook, look at this, and here's the company news. So, mm. you know, that's something you need to watch out for. But I, I thought it was very creative of her. And, and uh, <laughs> Now I, we're going to criticize every single picture on our feeds and wonder whether and you sure really we were, were there, and, Steve. Uh, and we'll receive criticism as well, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much, All Matt, right. for coming so. in and speaking with us today. It's Matt Driscoll from Reuters News. And now we've got plenty more still ahead on First Occasion. Including a new gold a futures contract has been launched in Hong Kong to tap Asian demand for the yellow metal. All those details when we return.